All right, now let's bring in our good friend and yours, Mo Egger of ESPN fifteen thirty. Mo, how we doing? Happy Monday, happy uh, tournament week to you. What's up? What's going on? I mean, there's just it's there's excitement in the air. Yes, I know that the local team is not local teams are not participating in the big dance. They have mm-hmm. they have a little dance mm-hmm. um, that they're doing, but still, tournament starts Thursday. Let's go, feeling good. I- Dayton Flyers tip all 430 on Thursday. So I've got that for me. Yeah. Uh yeah, you know, they're they're UC and Xavier are both playing. Um, you know, if if your favorite team is playing a game, you want them to score more points than the other team. And so yeah, yeah, I I hope I hope the Bearcats can can make a run. It's I like watching them play. So I I hope they I hope they keep winning. Or I hope they they start winning on Wednesday. Is that what it is? Wednesday. And then can make a, a run to Hinkle Fieldhouse. I thought about doing a tropey, uh, let's do a bracket of the Bengals free agent <laughs> signings. <laughs> and it felt like it would be, a, even for me, a little too much and and a little repetitive. So, I, so throwing that to the side. By the way, are you doing any sh- shows in studio? Like, you're all over the place this week. You're you're at Holy Grail on Thursday. You're yeah. at Turfway. We're going to go to Turfway Park tomorrow. We we are Turfway Park Racing and Gaming. We'll uh, we'll do uh, our our hour live together. I'm in studio Wednesday, and then I broadcast a broadcast from Turfway Tuesday in studio Wednesday, and then my favorite show of the year Thursday morning before the games tip off, ten to noon, and then we hang out and and watch games all day. You, you talked about the bracket trope. That is my favorite sports talk radio trope, and I feel like it has sort of. It's been cast aside because now March is so busy with NFL free agency that sports talk radio hosts don't have time to do like, you know, their 64 favorite candy bars or, you know, some shows it would be 65 hottest news babes, stuff like that. (laughs) I feel like those things have become a thing of the past. And there's a part of me that's saddened by it. My favorite one of those when when they, when everyone was doing them, someone did a brackets of the brackets, like which was <laughs> the best trophy bracket of all of them. And I thought I thought that was when we'd officially hit. OK, we've tied a bow on this entire yes. thing. I do want to ask you about free agency, though. Okay. So I'll just rather than going into a bracket simulation, I'll just say this. Someone asks you on the street. Mo Egger, ESPN 1530. What did you think of the Bengals free agency? What's the first thing you say? Fine. Fine, yeah. but questions, right? Uh, uh, you wrote about DJ Reader, and I think that's the great question of free agency. Did the Bengals get it right with DJ Reader? I wanted him back, but I can certainly understand why the team that employed him while he suffered an injury uh, would balk at, 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 at bringing him back and bringing him back at a certain cost. I, I am fascinated by how this is going to play out with DJ and with a position that was a weakness last year. And even though Sheldon Rankins looked like Geno Atkins 2.0 when he played against the Bengals this past November, it I, I still wonder what that position is going to look like moving forward. And so there wasn't a player that they've brought in that I didn't think, God, that could work. But I, I'm still wondering who the starting right tackle is going to be. And I'm still wondering, is defensive tackle going to go from a weakness to a strength? Um I, I I think there's so much gray. It's not black and white. It's not pass fail. I think in certain areas, the Bengals have done some things that I really, really like and I'm really intrigued by. And then they've done some things or maybe not done some things that make me wonder, okay, is that position really going to be significantly better once the, the game start in September? Yeah, it was a little bit of a blast from the past kind of in that, you know, it there wasn't uh, a splashy moment or a splashy signing or something that made you think, oh, new bangles, right? This was kind mm-hmm. of a little bit more of the, I wouldn't use the word conservative necessarily, but calculated, low-key, under-the-radar type of free agency where a lot of their picks are like, oh, that, that could be a really good low-key signing when we look back on it. And that's a way that they more used to approach free agency and and i mm-hmm. think they did here when you're whether you're talking about gino's gino stone or you're talking about zach moss i mean or, or even gesicki i think you can look at any of those and say man those could really end up looking really smart in the fall and great bargains whereas so many of the deals 
that are done across the league last week that are splashier, you say, boy, they could really end up regretting that uh, in the fall just because if it doesn't work out, it really hurts you. If these don't work out, yeah, it would hurt them, but these these weren't massive bargaining chips that they put out on the table. Yeah, and you, you talk about a splash. I mean, the biggest wow for me in this entire process was how the Joe Mixon thing ended. The greatest mm -hmm. divorce ever, right? All parties <laughs> got what they wanted. I mean, it, it's remarkable. The Bengals got you know, a player that fits the profile of what I think they were looking for at running back, younger, cheaper, and more explosive. Joe Mixon gets to go to a team that has a chance to be really good, and he gets paid. Like, I, I think it's 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 remarkable in this day and age where, you know, we've talked so much about the value of running backs. Here's a guy going into his eighth season who is a good player but not considered among the elite that just got $13 million from the Houston Texans guaranteed on top of whatever else he may earn. It just, it, it goes to show that not everybody's evaluation is the same. And it goes to show that not that Joe Mixon is trash. One man's trash is another man's treasure. It, that, that to me, I know you and I have talked about Joe Mixon a ton, how that ended is remarkable. And it's remarkable that it worked out for all parties involved. I, that was the biggest wow moment of the week for me on top of, you know, just other stuff that happened around the league. That is, that is fascinating. But yeah, I mean, look, I said months ago, and I think I said this to you, regardless of how the next couple of off season cycles play out, free agents, the cycle and the draft cycle, I'm going to emerge from this going, the Bengals have a chance to win the Super Bowl. I felt that way a month ago. I feel that way today. And it's, it's because, uh, Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, and T. Higgins are, as of right now at least, still together. So I, I that's the big macro thing for me has been, is Joe Burrow going to be healthy going into week one? Can he stay healthy? Can that trio of, of players play for the overwhelming majority of 17 games? And if the answer is yes, th this team's going to be okay. There was likely going to be nothing that happened in free agency, either additions or subtractions that made me feel different about that now. You know, specifically what they've done on offense, you and I talked about this last week. Mike Kosicki brings a level of tight end of explosiveness that um, we, I guess, really haven't seen. Zach Moss fits exactly what they're looking for. It's the theme of the offseason, explosiveness. And I love Geno Stone because I, I love players that the more you ask them to do, the, the better they do. And that certainly seems to, to be a fitting description of his time in Baltimore. But sure, I mean, some of the biggest questions going into the offseason were at defensive tackle and right tackle. I, I also think the, the Dax Hill dynamic is fascinating because, boy, they, <laughs> they've made a pretty bold statement at safety, right, with, with Von Bell coming back and, and, and Geno Stone. And so it's, it's a statement that, at least for me, the athletic profile of Dax Hill is awesome, but he, he's got a two-cent head. Like, we value – communication and we value intelligence and we value guys being in the right place. And so these are the sort of players we're going to bring into play safety. And Jordan battle was a better rookie than Dax Hill was a second year player last year. So by September, what role does Dax have on this team? Does Dax have a role on this team? What does that look like as the season evolves? I think he becomes really kind of the most intriguing individual player that comes back because a year ago at this time, we were talking about him replacing uh, a, a Pro Bowl safety. And now yeah. he might move to corner. He, you know, maybe you can make the argument that they should find a team that'll trade for him. I don't know, but his role on the team and where he fits in is really going to be interesting to, to kind of pay attention to. We play this game every year when the players first return of, you know, if you're a player, the last thing you want is to see me and James and Kelsey and the others <laughs> standing at your locker. It means something has happened with your role and people are yeah. wondering how you feel about it. Um, Dax will be that guy. I'm really curious his reaction. Look, mm -hmm. Dax was notably frustrated as a rookie mm -hmm. with not playing, with having to learn a bunch of different positions in the background being a first round pick, feeling like you should come in and contribute and, and just not thrilled with that. And then last year he got his opportunity and, and it didn't go super. And I wonder how his reaction will be to this off season, which has been 
push to the background again. Doesn't have a starting spot. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and how does he approach that? Is he, is that going to put him in the tank? Is that going to make him jump head first into, I got to be better to learn a new position. Would he feel refreshed moving to a new position? Like he's in a better spot. Would he ask for a trade? Would he like, we don't know how mm -hmm. Dax is reacting specifically mm -hmm. to all of this. And I think I'm really curious to see what that's going to be to know what you've got in him and, and how you should then proceed with the rest of free agency in the draft in the defensive back room. Cause if he can come in and be a motivated, willing piece uh, as a slot corner backup, whatever we could move back to safety. If things go sideways, like that's valuable to me, uh -huh. even, even, even if you have your questions about it. And, and he obviously can be your starting slot next year if he takes to it, if Mike Hilton leaves. But I really want to have a better feel for his thoughts and feelings and approach to another time feeling like this team is not valuing him in his eyes, I would imagine. Yeah, um, and, and I credit the Bengals because I feel like there are moments in franchise history where their approach at safety would have been shrug your shoulders and just hope the two guys they had back there, mainly Dax, just get better by osmosis. Like, I, I, I feel like, and I, I say this with no real examples, maybe you have one and maybe I'm off base, but I feel like there are times where they would have said, look, we drafted Dax Hill. With a, with a first round pick like that's our guy so we're not going to be aggressive at this position I, I like the fact they took the opposite approach look his play wasn't good enough last year there may be a role now moving forward where his play is more than sufficient or maybe this is a wake-up call for him and he shows up and he's a, a better player or maybe in a year or two we look back at how Von Bell came back and Geno Stone came back or, or uh, came to Cincinnati and, and those guys helped Dax Hill put together the sort of season that he needed to put together at safety or wherever. I don't know. But I know in the short term, they looked at that and said, Dax Hill's not good enough. And yeah, man, we, we used a first round pick on him and we brought him along his rookie year in a way that was maybe going to allow him to, to flourish as a versatile guy. But his play at this position wasn't good enough. And so we're moving on. We're moving on and we'll see how this plays out long term. But sorry. Uh, we we can't sit around and simply hope that Dax Hill just gets better because uh, he's a year older. I like that. I also think the the discourse around the possibilities at right tackle were interesting. So Makai Becton comes in for a visit, and there was a lot about his season last year with the Jets to not like, right? Pro football focus grade was miserable, penalties, sacks given up. It wasn't good. And then there's this panic that sets in, OMG, is this the kind of guy they're going to sign? Well, if we all agreed they were saying goodbye to Jonah Williams and we all agreed they had to go get a right tackle, guess what? Chances are that player wasn't going to be as good as Jonah Williams. The profile of that player was going to fit more of a guy like Makai Becton than, than Jonah, who obviously goes and, and gets his money with the Arizona Cardinals. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how we react to what they do at that position. I'm certainly hopeful that in this, you know, tremendous class of tackles that the guy starting week one is good enough uh, uh, to play as a rookie in the first game of the season. But if you were looking at free agency, kind of turning up your nose at some of the other right tackle options, well, those guys probably aren't as good as Jonah Williams. And so a guy like Makai Becton or someone similar is what you're going to get. And I thought we all understood that when we agreed the Bengals are probably going to move on from Jonah Williams and we're okay with it. Yeah, because I mean, you would hope to have somebody that you have even more confidence in and not than not than Jonah, but, you know, where it's think Riley Reef, right? I mean, yeah. I, I look at it in that <laughs> way. I mean, where somebody where you're like, I didn't okay. want to think about him anymore, but thank you. No, <laughs> but when they signed Riley Reef, it was like, mm -hmm. OK, a dude who's done it, he's mm -hmm. he should replace Reef on his back with serviceable. Right. Like, that's mm -hmm. what. It should say that's what you want. You want solid, not a total liability, serviceable right tackle in case the rookie kid needs more time. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that's still there. I think that's still I think Becton could be that. I think other names that are out there can be that. And so I, I don't necessarily look at that at all as as a problem or not having gone to plan 
yet. I do think that them not taking the more aggressive route, whether it was somebody like Jonah or anybody that you are going after a, a right tackle, which I think that would be a stretch to think that they would have spent a ton of money on right tackle. If you look at all at their history of what they've said of, we'll pretty much put whoever in there at right tackle has kind of been their attitude over the last however many years that it's all still there in front of you. And if these, all these, if you're really getting somebody who is in any other year, a 10th overall pick at tackle, like, and putting him in there and not having to do it even week one, you're in a pretty good spot for win. This team wants to be playing in January, right? Where mm -hmm. that right tackle rookie should be pretty damn good by that point. You should have a decent feel for how they're going to be. Not saying that they'll be perfect, but that's the chance of them to really kind of start to blossom and understand the league. And, and I think you're in a good spot in 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 that regard to to handle whatever goes on and so I, I i don't look at it as a big problem i think that they're still in a pretty good place there yeah i would agree and it's also like they have to start nailing draft picks on the offensive line right <laughs> uh, I, I mean you know they they get credit for being aggressive on the offensive line and basically blowing up that two, 2021 unit and doing it with with free agents each one to different degrees of success and then orlando brown uh, the following off season. But you know, what's that line going to look like in a couple of years? If, if the well is totally dry in regards to, to players on the offensive line, they draft and develop B because, you know, we have these conversations about what they're going to do with T Higgins and Jamar chase. Well, um, they're probably not going to be able to, not that they spent lavishly, so to speak with the guys they signed on the offensive line, but they were still expensive players relative to what you're getting if if you have guys in their rookie contract. So what's the offensive line? If you really want to talk long-term, what's the O-line going to look like when, you know, it's it's time to move on from Kappa and Karras and, and Orlando Brown? And, and, and not that anybody's looking to move on from any of those players now, but if you want to talk long-term, boy, at some point, they've got to start nailing it on the offensive line. Maybe they did with Cordell Volson. I don't know, but they didn't with Jackson Carmen. And then you could go back a number of years and look at the guys they didn't nail it with. Like they've, they've got to start getting it right on the offensive line. So that entire like years long process can start with the draft this year and you go, okay, right tackle. This is, this is the guy around which everything's going to evolve on the offensive line moving forward because as, as much as I can appreciate them being willing to spend to get rid of that trash can offensive line in 2021, Signing three or four offensive linemen in an offseason is not ideal. Uh, no. At some point, you've got to start nailing it on the offensive line. And so that right tackle, I view as a very, if, assuming they take one, I think that's a fair assumption, uh, th That that's a guy that we have to be talking about not only by the end of this season, like if he's playing, he's playing well, but okay, there's right tackle, check that box. Now we've got to start to think about what the O-line is going to look like in the second half of the decade. Uh, and, and not that you can't sign free agents, but I don't know that they really can do what they tried to do two off seasons ago. I, I don't know that the O line can constantly be this churn of a free agents you're bringing in from elsewhere, especially when you get to the real money years of Joe Burrow's deal and what Jamar Chase is going to be getting. And so I kind of view the offensive lineman they take this year as the guy that's going to set in motion, hopefully, a series of years where they start to get it right with uh, young offensive linemen in the draft. I I love that they have been willing to pay, right? Like we've yeah. talked about that. I, I love that they've been willing to do that and, and maybe even self-scouted their own issues there or whatever. Mm -hmm. But at, the, at a certain point, you are not going to win a Super Bowl or your ability to win a Super Bowl is going to be defined by not just your draft picks, but your offensive draft picks and specifically your offensive line draft picks. They cannot survive another run like the last 10 years, mm -hmm. essentially, of missing on almost all of these guys. Um, you know, I don't have a problem with what they got out of Jonah Williams. I don't think they necessarily missed on that pick. I don't, you know, that you look at that class, it wasn't that bad, but yeah, that's fine. But you got to get at least that, but that's using a top pick. You can't consistently not get anything from the back of the draft. Like maybe Jonah and Cordell giving them a few more hits is a sign of them figuring it out a little bit better. You know, we heard 
some of the coaches talk last time about how they look. They feel like they've learned from some of their more recent mistakes of making sure they're focusing on the guys who are going to be about the right stuff, doing the right things, and not getting tantalized by traits all the time hmm. and, and focusing more on that. And, and maybe they have, but it has to happen now. Like you can't have that miss again. And if you look at it and I know I hear a ton of Bengals fans come at me with the look, they, they are not drafting enough athletes and sending me the relative athletic score graph that we've all seen of, of they have all these dudes that are, that are sloppy and slow and whatever, I, you know, fine. I mean, they're, they're going to have bigger, more powerful guys. Cause that's something that Joe Burrow wants, mm -hmm. but maybe they need to do a better analysis on what exactly that means in, in the guys that they've taken and learning from that. And, and, but you can't, you certainly can't miss here. If you're going to take it at 18, because that guy has to play and you have to learn the hard way. And you're going to go down a he lane again. And nobody <laughs> wants to do that because if you draft a guy in the first round, he's got to play and mm -hmm. he's going to play for multiple years. And he is going to be charged with protecting Joe Burrow. And we know what that means right now and how quickly that can send a season sideways. And so you just can't be missing if you're going to be going that route and you need to go that route. And they are. There's so much pressure on them to understand that position better and start getting it right more consistently right now, specifically starting with this first pick. You're right on. It's going to be massive. Yeah, it, it's it's a huge pick for this year. It's it's also a huge pick. Look, the, the second half of this decade, the the dynamic of building a roster is just going to be different. You know, as much as you want to say, well, the cap doesn't exist. I know that's a big popular meme on Twitter. Roster building in the second half of the decade, the next phase of Joe Burrow's uh, time as a Bengal is going to be significantly different. And, you know, again, nothing against what they did post-2021 on the offensive line, but at some point, man, You've you've got to have homegrown guys that you develop that are are working as uh, on rookie contracts and you're getting a lot out of them. They they I think they got it right with Jonah Williams. Did he ever play to the level of the eleventh overall pick? Maybe not, but but he was a, a a good player for this team and he was the only offensive lineman they wanted to keep post two thousand twenty one. And there's some value in that. But yeah, I I view this I view the offensive lineman they take. If we assume that's what they're doing with the eighteenth pick, that right tackle. They've got to nail it. They've got to nail it for right now for 2024, but that's got to be a really foundational piece uh, moving forward. And so I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in how that, and how that plays out. And in the interim, you know, serviceable right tackle. When, when we all decided that Jonah Williams is gone. Okay. That's what they were signing up for was serviceable. They weren't signing up for high end. They weren't signing up for a, uh, a guy just coming off playing in the Pro Bowl, they were coming. They were coming off going from Jonah to serviceable to bridge the gap between Jonah and what's next. What's next has to be really good. Yeah, um, I want to switch gears real quick to. Uh, so I was out at the Ted Karras event on mm -hmm. Sunday, St. Taddy's Day, which mm -hmm. Ted is just a legend. Like yes. it is unbelievable what he has done mm -hmm. to like get people to rally together. Like we can't get our country to agree on anything, right? <laughs> anything. But everybody's like, but Ted Karras is great. Yeah. And we're all, there were thousands of people at the Foling warehouse. Okay. I mean, every, every major sponsor in the city was there. Mm -hmm. you know, people are just, everyone's just getting inked up to say, I <laughs> came to Ted Karras's event for life. Permanent. Yes. On your arm saying Ted Karras's, since he had logo on me for life, I'm in. I it's fascinating, and he's just like raising money, and he's awesome. hooked up with Ken Anderson. And I just like this dude is an absolute legend. My question to you is: Is there in your history a sports person moment logo that you would get a tattoo of for life on you? Are you? I'm tattoo free. Are you tattoo free? I am a thousand percent tattoo free. Yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. And oh, and shout out, by the way, Joe Burrow donating twenty five grand to uh, Ted Karras's foundation mm -hmm. uh, to to all of that uh, village of Marici just because basically for challenging Ted's like, look, 
yeah, we were at the free agent dinner and it's me and it's Gino Stone and and we're hanging out there. We're all, all of us there. And it wasn't necessarily that he said, I'll give $25,000 if you get the tattoo because Ted wasn't going to do it because his wife doesn't want him to. He's like, it was kind of mm-hmm. the challenge of Burrow being like, you got to do it. I'm going <laughs> to give the money. And like, I feel like if Burrow came up to me and said, I'd give you 25 grand, I don't really honestly care what the logo is. Like, I'll do whatever. I'll probably. I mean, Fine. it's going to the human fund, money for people, right? I'm doing yeah. it for me. I'm not giving it to my charity necessarily, although I'd love to if I have a good one, but <laughs> I'm getting it. So I'm not. So Ted gets it. Would you, what would you get? What, what would you get? Maybe even for free. Well, first of all, on, on the Ted Karras thing, this has been really fun to watch because Ted's a good player, but, but not like a national household name, right? Like Joe yeah. Burrow is. So for this guy to come in as a free agent and, and in a very organic way, get people talking about the village of Murchie and what he's trying to accomplish just through the sales of hats. It's, yeah. it's awesome. Like it's, 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 it's what, it's what it's, it's a component of what sports are supposed to be about at this level. And, and it's just, it's fun. The Bengals coming off a disappointing season and yet still rallying around Ted being the, the, the Bengals, Walter Payton man of the year nominee and winning the, the online challenge. And it's, it's just, it's really neat to watch, man. I mean, in, in a day and age where we're so jaded and skeptical, skeptical about pretty much anything that might be good, here's legitimate good. Uh, and, and so it's a, it's a credit to Ted. It, it's a, it's a credit and it's, it's just, it's really neat. It's really neat to watch. Uh, and again, nothing against Ted has been a, a solid NFL player for years, but it's, it's one thing when it happens around a guy who's got a huge national profile or, or a dude with just this overwhelming effervescent personality, you know, here you have a relatively unassuming guy. You certainly know him better than, than most that just in a very organic way, got people talking about something good and got people involved and mobilized. And, and I think it's awesome. I, 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 I really do think it's cool in terms of a tattoo. Now, yeah. I'm not a tat guy. Like no. dudes built like me don't get tattoos. Let's no, it's, like, it's not. It doesn't let's, look good. No, it, it doesn't. Uh, my, my friend Rich Wahlberg and I in 2000, Kenyon Martin's senior year, mm. UC was the number one team in the country. We said, this is going back now almost a quarter of a century. If the Bearcats win the national title, we're getting C. Paul tattoos. Obviously, it didn't happen that year. Um, but and Rich passed away about two years ago, a little bit more than two years ago. I still feel like if it ever did happen, and granted, it's it, NIT doesn't count. Okay. No, uh, you, you would not get the NIT a C. Paul with an NIT logo on you if they win the nit this year no no uh, it was national what about one of those temporary ones that lasts like three to four weeks fine that, that my daughter gets yes and yeah. i'll, I'll yeah. do i'll okay. do that but <laughs> i we made that vow now at the time i was 22 years old right 22 23 i was 22 years old uh and so now i'm not 22 anymore here we are 24 years later i believe that i still would have to do that if you see one the national championship where I, I don't, I don't know. Um, but, but I think I would have to do that. I think yeah. I would have to do that a to honor Rich's memory. B it is a vow I made 24 years ago. And so if that ever does happen now, he and I, and it was right before he passed, you see football made the college football playoff. And, and we did discuss, uh, well, if football wins the national title, are we going tattoo? And I said, yes. Yeah. So I guess I would have to apply it to the Bearcats, but then one might say, well, wait a minute. What if the Bengals win one? I, th- I don't know. Uh, but, but I, uh, one time, a long time ago, I did make a vow. If the Bearcats ever won a national title, I would, I would get a tattoo. And I think we were going to, there were going to be like calf tat. Like it was going to be, I would walk around the rest of my life with a, a UC, a C Paul, my cat. I don't, but that was, I don't know. <laughs> right. I, I mean, I, I don't think we ever really vowed a specific place on our bodies. I, Again, dudes built like me, like you put it on your arm. <laughs> you know, yeah. if you're built like an NFL offensive lineman, a tattoo looks cool on your arm. If you're like me, no. So then where do you go? Like, what? What? what I don't know. Th- this Ted is why went, I've never Ted gotten with the tattoo. Hip. Ted, went, Ted went hip. And I okay. think hip's not bad because basically no one's going to see that. 
Right. Uh, but it's, if you're trying for no one to see it, uh, mm-hmm. then I guess that's where you go. But I don't mind somewhere where like if if I'm in a non work environment, you can see it. If I'm sw- like, I, but again, I'm not looking good. I don't I don't want to be. I don't want to make draw any more attention to my body than I already am, you know, by yeah. not having a shirt on while I'm swimming or whatever. But I do. I, here's what, here's my thought. You remember how uh, everybody would make fun of AJ McCarron for the big tat that he the like wings across his chest yeah. that he had it was a mm-hmm. whole thing. Here's what I think. Maybe you should consider, or not. Maybe I would consider is that as a formative thing. Instead of like eagles wings going all across my chest wire to wire oh all my. the way across right or like down here like tupac had thug life it just says wire to wire on it maybe like <laughs> smaller underneath it says like where's quinones underneath <laughs> it a little bit or let's go reho on the other side you know from the wire to wire video i think i feel like that's the move <laughs> i knocked down my you camera so good at knocking the camera over so- <laughs> I think that's the move. I think that's I think that's what we uh we should look back on. If the Reds ever win again, we go back and we we do wire to wire. Okay, done. Uh for those who don't understand the reference, the 1990 World Series VHS video which came out months after the Reds won the World Series, it is aside from the movie Clerks, it is probably the VHS or DVD I have watched the most. So much it's on YouTube. I can as as that thing, if we put it on right now, as that thing oh. is playing, I could I could step right in and 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 narrate the thing along with Pat O'Brien. I can <laughs> I can drop the where's Queen Onus right when the, the rosy reds are up there screaming it. And then yep. I could recite Lou Pinella when they flash to him and he's explaining specifically where Quinonis is. I could that that is the the thing that I could recite line for line. It is yes. an iconic piece of early 90s uh Cincinnati and frankly Americana culture. So yes. go watch it. It's wire to wire. It is ter- you got Jose Rios' oh. ex-wife referring to him by his last name. Yes. You've got uh, Ricky Henderson at his locker after they lose game three. You got the whole saga with Tom Browning leaving the stadium in game two that they narrate as he's uh there for his his baby being born during the game. You got the Rosie Reds. It is I'm going to now go spend my Monday night watching yeah. as we wait for the NCAA yeah. tournament to begin. This is going to happen. Yeah, I think I'm back. I think I'm I think I'm back. It really should be a thing every year, actually, that we watch like the Wednesday night before opening day. Go back, watch wire to wire, because what do you do the next day on opening day if they win? Wire to wire. Wire right? to wire. Everybody says it. You're, you talk about wire to wire on opening day every single year. I guarantee you we will do it again. Uh, when we when we meet up in right field, as I assume that we will on opening day, and yes. wire to wire will be mentioned. We'll yes. quote a lot of these same things. I look forward to it. I feel like it should be a thing every year on that Wednesday uh, that that we get it, and then in that way, when they do win, we get the tattoo. That's my thought. But, I'm in. Yeah. Oh, all okay. right, Mo. I, I don't know that, oh, I, I don't know that I'm going full like AJ. I mean, I, I don't. My wife, I don't. And she'd probably laugh at it. You know, Maybe, I, I don't know. It doesn't have to be full McCarran style. We could think of a better spot uh, for it to be, but I feel like I feel like it's got potential. That's all I'm saying. On That's my all. list of people that I've always wanted to interview is Pat O'Brien, who's yeah. had this remarkable career of what a wild ride. Wild <laughs> ride. I mean, you know, professionally, it, sort of like in in the 80s and 90s, like the 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 studio host of everything that that I yeah. grew up watching, but then. If you'll ever, ever Google like Pat O'Brien voicemails, interesting stuff mm. there has kind of had an interesting off camera life, but I just want to talk to him about narrating that video. Yeah. <laughs> because it's, it sounds like he's like, all right, I'll do it. One take. Let's go. One. Take. Yeah. He was not spending two days in a no. booth reading the wire to wire script. It was fine. I'll give you an hour. Let's go. Let's read it. It, it is as casually done as you could imagine. And it's That's terrific. Perfect. It's what makes it perfect. All right, yes. Mo. I appreciate it. Good luck with the hot wings. Uh, I, I'm sure this <laughs> will be excellent. And I look forward to seeing you at the uh, at the old racetrack at Turfway tomorrow. Yes. That'll be a nice change Turfway up for Park us. Park Racing and Gaming. It's going to be unbelievable. Let's go. Thanks, Mo. Appreciate it. All right, man. Thank you.